you. I'm Frank Harris, president of the Friends of the Ramsey County Libraries. It's my honor to uh, uh, kick this off today and to welcome you all. Here we are on a slightly gray day, but we're surrounded by uh, great books and we have a great author. And so uh, you're my kind of crowd if, uh, if, you're, if you're here today with, uh, with books. Uh, I want to uh, introduce some, uh, some VIPs that are here, of course. Uh, we have a number of our board members. I'd like you all to stand. I'll make this quick, but we have Lynn Belgia and uh, Mary Carter, Kathy Krogan, uh, Melissa Cuff, Dick Fowler, John Harris, Kathy Robbins, Pam Harris, Valerie Wise, I don't think I've missed anyone. Any, anyone else? Great. These are the folks that work all year to uh, make the Friends the organization that it is. And then uh, uh, a very important person uh, sitting right here with me, uh, our esteemed Ramsey County Library Director, Jill Boldenow. Jill? Thanks for all you do. You, uh, as we're beginning, take a look at your tables. If you have not, you have some things there. You have uh, uh, a uh, Friends Gala bookmark. There'll be more about the gala uh, as we go forward. And also uh, a brochure that describes the summer reading program. And this is, this is really an important element of, uh, of what we and the library uh, uh, can provide. Uh, it's, uh, th this author luncheon is the kickoff for our teen programming and summer reading program. So check that out uh, when you have an opportunity. And now uh, let me introduce uh, Denise Perche. Denise, come on up. She's going to introduce our, uh, our speaker of the day. Take it away, Denise. Thank you so much. Thank you, Frank. And welcome. Can everybody hear me? This morning, it is my pleasure to introduce to you today's speaker, Diane Wilson. Diane is an award-winning Minnesota author who is enrolled on the Rosebud Reservation. Her first book, Spirit Car, Journey to a Dakota Past, retraces her family's Dakota heritage across five generations. Spirit Car, won a 2006 Minnesota Book Award and was selected for the 2012 One Minneapolis, One Read program. Her second book, Beloved Child, A Dakota Way of Life, received a 2012 award from History Colorado. Diane is also the executive director for Dream of Wild Health a Native American farm in Hugo, Minnesota, that reconnects Native people with indigenous foods and medicines. Diane was awarded a Bush Fellowship in 2013 and was recently selected for an 50 over 50 award from Pollen, which celebrates and recognizes Minnesotans over the age of 50 who have made significant contributions and achievements in their communities. On a personal note, I have known Diane my entire life. We just so happen to be cousins. <laughs> Our family is so very proud of her accomplishments, and I am grateful for the lessons that I have learned from her. A few of those, that words matter, that there is power in truth, and that there is peace in knowing where you came from. Please join me in welcoming Diane Wilson. Well, introductions don't get any better than that. Mitakiapi, ampetu kinde iushkiyama chiankapiya. Washichu uh, ya, Diane Wilson, Imakiapia, Bedewa Kantuano, Yate Hematahaya. Hello, all my relatives. It's really good to see you here today. 
Uh, my name is Diane Wilson, and I am Dakota and enrolled on the Rosebud Reservation. And I just want to say about Denise and her mother, Pauline, in particular, when I was really struggling with this first book, it was Denise and her mom, Pauline, who really helped me get that book done. So it wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be here without them. Um, so uh, one of the things we've been talking about is the great read at our table, which what a phenomenal um, way of celebrating literature around the country. I hope, um, I'm, I'm guessing that many of you are participating in that. Uh, also really relieved that um, they made a good choice for the national winner. I was, I was really p uh, pleased about that. But today I wanna to talk to you about um, one of my favorite authors, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about my process in writing these books, how they came together. Um, I'll read a little bit from Spirit Car and a little bit of an essay that was published um, not too long ago, and um, you know, tell a few stories. So not, not anything too embarrassing for the family. <laughs> no, nothing I haven't already told. <laughs> um, but one of my favorite authors is Thomas King. So he's a native writer. Uh, many of you may be familiar with his work. But he wrote a book that was really inspirational to me. And the title of it is The Truth About Stories is That That's All We Are. And I thought, well, what a great title. I wonder what that means. So, and it's a great book, really well written. But if you think about it, um, it is true that we are all about our stories. You know, when we get up in the morning, we tell ourselves a story about who we are and where we came from and what we're gonna do that day. So our stories define who we are. They tell us who our families are. They carry our values. They carry our most cherished memories. They carry our creation stories, our spirituality. They carry our past, and they help create our future. Our stories also have the power to change lives. So um, I want to talk today about a story that really changed my life that set the direction for who I am, that um, inspired me to not only become a writer, but also to do the work that I do at Dream of Wild Health. And that is a story that my mother shared with me when I was a teenager growing up in Minneapolis. So I was one of um, five children, and my dad was Swedish, and my mother was Lakota, and I knew that she went to, um, she spent six years at the Holy Rosary Mission School on the Pine Ridge Reservation. But she really didn't like to talk about it. You know, she would say, we were poor and I'm done with all that. And when she said poor, she meant South Dakota Depression era poor. This is patching your shoes with cardboard. I see people nodding their head. You know what I mean when I talk mm. about um, Depression era in particular, but the South Dakota, Everybody was poor, there was no, there was very little work. And so for her family, um, her family of nine, the oldest, the oldest five girls um, were sent to boarding school when their dad didn't have, couldn't find work, he was a rancher. So my, my mother and her, um, her closest sister, Pauline, Denise's mom, were when they when he was between jobs, they were sent off to various boarding schools. So my mother spent six years at Holy Rosary. Some of the older girls um, grew up actually at St. Francis Mission School on the Rosebud Reservation. So um, so it was so then I grew up in Minneapolis, which is a world away from her upbringing. But when she was so so when I was a teenager. Um, she told me this story and it really stood out because she didn't like to talk about it. And she said that, that when she was at Holy Rosary and she, was, she didn't have any siblings with her at that time and her family was in Rapid City and so you didn't get to go home for the school year. There, it was just, it was too far. They didn't have any money to come visit. So one day when the priest said, would you like to go home to Rapid City and see your family? Well, of course, she was ecstatic about that. And so when they got there, her house was empty and her family had moved. And she didn't know where they were. Um, so she had to go back to boarding school. They found out that 
the, her family had moved to Minneapolis looking for work, not realizing that she would make this you know, unexpected <coughs> visit home. But it was two years before she could, uh, before they had enough money to send for her. Mm -hmm. so, so she told me that story, and, I, and I'm pretty sure she was saying it as a way of pointing out how good I had it. And, you know, being a teenager, that, that just went right past me. <laughs> um, but, what, but what did happen is that it attached to my heart. You know, and that story I carried forward because I didn't understand it. I didn't understand how she could be left. Um, I knew my grandparents were good people, but how could they leave a child? And, and I also didn't understand um, how she wasn't angry about it. Um, how she could be so matter of fact. So I carried that story forward into my life, um, not really knowing what to do with it. And then when I became an adult and I had my own daughter, I began to ask the questions about who is our family? Who am I? And what am I going to tell my daughter about who she is? So that started the search. And for those of you in the room, I know you're all great readers, but for those of you who like to write, sometimes that search just starts with a question. Like, why did this happen? How can I understand it? So I just started looking at the question, what, what are boarding schools? And I went back and I looked at that history. And you know, despite the fact that we had three generations in our family go through boarding schools, Nobody understood, no, none of us ever learned why they were there. We just thought, oh, they help your family out when you, you, know, you need a place to feed your children. Um, but, but the reality of it was that they were started in 1887 by uh, Colonel Richard Pratt, modeled after the prison schools, and that they were a place to forcibly assimilate Native children. And so, um, so it was a very different history that I was starting to learn. And so, um, while I was learning about boarding schools and land allotment and blood quantum, I was also driving all over South Dakota. And do we have anybody from South Dakota in here? Yeah, it's a, okay, it's a great state. Very wide open, a lot of empty space. <laughs> so um, I got the feeling at some point that all this, all this uh, I was talking to family members and visiting old homesteads and and going places and gathering stories. And I, I got this feeling like, wow, I don't feel like I'm traveling alone anymore. And that's what led to writing the chapter on Spirit Car and the actual name of it, that idea that we are not traveling alone, that we have our relatives with us all the time. So I'm going to read um, just a brief part of Spirit Car, just because that is such a such an uh, important part of the book, the fact that we're all traveling with our relatives. <clears throat> I don't tell this to a lot of people, but sometimes I drive a spirit car. Ordinarily, I drive a Toyota Corolla, a dependable vehicle that suits an earnest, straightforward writer like myself. But after three weeks of traveling around South Dakota, digging up information about long dead relatives, I need something better suited to their needs. These long weeks in South Dakota had taught me that there was more to research than history books and genealogy charts. I had become a hunter, silent and still, stalking the family myths that were hidden in these hills. One day I realized that the wind had its own voice and the land listened to my footsteps. And my entire back seat was filled with relatives who wondered why I wasn't paying attention to their part of the family story. That's when it all started to come together. The mess of facts and old photographs and the smell of sun-baked fields, my own myth rising up from fragments of the past. Of course, my relatives also like to travel in style. I had no choice but to get a spirit car, a big old Cadillac with fins, fancy hubcaps, leather seats, and power windows, something in sky blue that blends with the horizon, whipping up a gust of warm wind as we roar down the, the highway. I tell you, after a couple of weeks on the road, I'm tired of the squabbling. 
It's a car full of grandmothers and grandfathers, aunts and uncles, crying infants, and everyone wants a seat by the window. I tell them right up front, I've got work to do, so come along for the ride, but don't get in the way. Sooner or later, they all come up to the front seat and whisper stories in my ear. I remember them as best I can, the way a person remembers a dream upon waking. They seem to know that I need help to find the way back, and so they come, pleased to be remembered. You might say that a spirit is really a restless memory, and they love riding the back roads around the reservation, or following the fence line for miles, checking for gaps in the wire. I've learned to recognize them, the way the wind will suddenly cloak itself in a handful of dust and swirl across a cemetery. Welcome, welcome, the spirits say, bending the branches of old tired cedar trees. But when I come close to the border, I know they start missing home. I tell them, that's okay, ride as far as you can. About the time I hit the bright lights on the edge of the city, I'm back in my old Toyota with only the faint scent of wild sage in the air. So that was my experience riding around South Dakota. <coughs> and that journey took me to, um, that trip took, that research took me to the Journey Museum in Rapid City, um, which is a really beautiful museum. It, it, um, it features both settler history and Lakota history. And so I stopped in there one day, taking a break, and came across an, an exhibit that was, um, it was called Breakdown of Tioche Baye, and it was about um, boarding schools. So I wandered in there, and I started reading the essay about Breakdown of Tioche Baye. And what I learned is that uh, Tioche Baye means extended family. And it's a really important concept in Dakota and Lakota culture about how we are all related. It's mitaku ye owasi, we are all related. And it means that we take care of each other, we respect each other, we have a protocol for how we interact with each other, but everything around you, um, all of us in this room, um, the, the land outside, the water, the air, we're all relatives and we, we owe each other, we have a responsibility to take care of each other. And so as I'm, wa as I'm reading that, it talked about how boarding schools then, when you took children out of a traditional family where they didn't get their language and their culture and their values, they didn't get traditional upbringing, that that really contributed to the breakdown of that extended family. And so I was looking at the photographs, and there in the middle of one wall was a photograph with a long line of young women. And in the middle of that line, I saw these skinny legs that I would recognize anywhere. And that my mother's nickname was Sticks. So, you know, there she was in this photograph in an essay on the breakdown of Tioche Baye. And that's when I started to understand how my family's story, which well, I thought was just us, that we, it was us who had made these decisions, was connected back out to this much larger history around assimilation. And that's when I started to um, realize that the story I was telling through my family was really a story that is is connected to what has happened to Native people across the country over many generations. And so that became the inspiration for, um, for Spirit Car. Um, one of the books that I read was by Severt, Severt Young Bear, and he said, a family's history, its name, its unique identity only survive as long as there is someone to remember them. And each one of us carries that responsibility. Each one of us, on our time, carries responsibility for our name, our actions, what we're putting out there into our families that's gonna shape the future of that family. So for me, it was taking responsibility for a history that my mother um, and, that, and her generation really, they, they survived it. 
but they didn't ha but they were also in some ways silenced by it by the pain of it but uh, they were a generation that didn't speak out because it was too dangerous and so for me writing spirit car was about giving voice to my mother's story um, i really wrote it for her uh, being able to tell her story of what happened um, not only going to boarding school and when she came home but but five generations in the family. And so she read much of the piece. The, I would go out on a trip, I'd write a piece, and I'd bring it back, and she would read it. And um, the very first piece I wrote was actually about her being left at boarding school. And she read it, and, she, and you know, I thought, well, if she does, this is too painful. I, I won't go forward. You know, I just leave it be. But she read it, and she just said, that feels right. And I thought, Yes, you know, I've got a green light to go forward in this, in this work. And so um, she actually passed before Spirit Car was published, but she had read most of the work, so I felt like she was there all along the way. And then it was after, um, so I finished it right after she, she passed, and it was her sister, Pauline, who uh, really helped me finish it. So... Um, you know, it has been a, a very much a family, a family effort to bring that, that book out. Um, but once I finished Spirit Car, then I thought, well, now I know the history, what do I do? You know, I can't just sit here with this, this knowledge and, and not do something. So I thought, um, I, I, that was my new question. What do you do once you understand the history? How do we begin to transform it? I can't go through my life thinking, because, because it's such a violent world and, and genocide is not uncommon, not only in this country's history, but across the world, how do we transform the harms that people do to each other? And that led to the question um, that is at the heart of beloved child. And that is, how do we take, how do we take this history and transform it into a better way of life for our children, because it's that's what matters: is that our children, um, that our children be given what they need to to survive and to thrive. So, um, one of the conversations that I had uh, participating in in uh, Dakota March um, was with a, a man, Harley Eagle, and he told me about the story. Well, he reminded me of the story in. Water Lily, written by Ella Cara Deloria, which is a beautiful novel. It, and that is the child beloved ceremony where um, a, a child whose life has been, at has been at risk for an accident or illness um, is given a special ceremony, a special outfit, moccasins that are beaded on the bottom. And it represents that this child is going to be carried and held throughout their life. Um, because they are so cherished. So that gave me a much better understanding of this is traditional Dakota way of life. This is Dakota parenting. And when you think about all the statistics that are out there now, all the challenges facing uh, Native people, it's really important to understand that this is where the culture comes from. This is what matters. So um, I, I, um, I talked to an elder Glenn Washichuna, and he was the one that said to me, um, I asked him, you know, about doing this work, and he said, heal yourself first. And I thought, huh, <laughs> I wonder how you do that. <laughs> so the only thing I know to do then is write. So I said, so I, I decided that I would ask people that I knew whose lives just impressed me with the way they had transformed um, their own hard experiences. So a woman who went to boarding school, um, uh, somebody else who was part of the voluntary relocation program, another one, um, family raising their children outside of public schools because of their experience, how traumatic it is for children, Native children, to go to schools where their history and their culture is not recognized. So I interviewed them, put their, those interviews together as stories, and that is the, that's what um, Beloved Child is all about. Uh, one of the people that I talked to is um, Clifford Chanku, and he is a traditional spiritual leader 
and a retired Presbyterian minister. And I asked him about that once, you know, how does, how does that work? Because <laughs> those, to me, seem very different. And, you know, and I have sometimes a hard time reconciling the history of our churches in supporting boarding schools. They were instrumental in supporting boarding schools um, for many years. So what he told me was, well, there's no difference. At essence, um, the, the native spirituality and Christianity have much in common. So you just have to stay with the essential truths of those spirituality. So that, he really helped me understand that. Um, he also said that whenever you speak in public, remind people that this history that we're talking about, which is, you know, the 1862 Dakota War, um, the boarding schools, all of these difficult challenges that have led to um, the challenges that, that Native communities face today is a very short time in our history that Dakota people have been in Minnesota for thousands of years, and that, and that the culture, um, that original culture, the beauty and brilliance of that culture is what we pay attention. That's what we need to get back to. So, so, um, so that's what, so Beloved Child is about really, go, really understanding the trauma, but from a place of it can be transformed and then getting back to what is that beauty and the values and the teachings of the culture. So it's intended to be, um, it's, it's not an easy read because it is, it does get deep into the trauma issues, but it's also intended to be a very hopeful book. We can do this work and we have to all do it together because this is a shared history in Minnesota, but um, it's doable. So, so that book then led to the next question, which is, okay, so what do I do then? I see all these great inspiring um, models from people in the community, but what can I do um, besides write, you know? <laughs> so so I, uh, at about that time while I was working on these books, I heard about this um, tiny little garden in Farmington and they were, it's called Dream of Wild Health. And it was just a tiny little program and they were growing out old seeds. And I'm a gardener. So I thought, well, I've got to go down there. I've got to be with that work for whatever reason. I heard that they had 800 year old tobacco, traditional tobacco that's used for prayer. Um, they had uh, corn, Cherokee corn that was carried on that original trail of tears. So if you can imagine that those corn seeds were carried by the grandmothers and the mothers on that, on that removal, on that march, and people are starving. But if you are a seed keeper, if you are a person responsible for making sure that these foods survive, then you have to do whatever is necessary to protect them. So they hid them in their pockets, they hid them in the hems of their skirts, and they made sure that whenever they got to where they were going, that there was corn to plant for the next season. So to me, this was such a beautiful teaching about the work we have to do in this world to protect what we love. And so um, I got involved as a volunteer um, down at Dream of Wild Health, and then um, that was in 2000, and it was shortly after they were given a gift from a Potawatomi elder and seed keeper, and her name was Cora Baker, and she had gardened all her life, grew the old corn, hung it up on her barn to dry. People would stop by to visit, and then they would give her seeds. So she collected them all her life. She had a couple hundred varieties, and then she was in her 90s and getting, you know, getting ready to pass and really worried about those seeds. And her kids didn't want them because it's too much responsibility. And I get that. So she heard about Dream Wild Health and she wrote a letter and said, I had prayed and prayed that uh, Native people would start gardening again and that uh, children would understand the importance of gardening. So she sent her collection to Dream of Wild Health, and that really became the core of the work. So in, in um, 2005, uh, we bought a farm up in Hugo, a 10-acre organic farm, 
And then finally, after hanging around years as a volunteer, they hired me full time. <laughs> you know, they find work for you. <laughs> so I took over as the director in 2011. Um, and then that became the next, boy, the next, I have learned so much being part of that organization. I never understood just how important our food is to who we are, uh, who we are, especially in a cultural sense. Knowing, I mean, regardless of where you come from, there's probably traditional foods that you recognize. I mean, lafsa is a traditional food. Um, and, so, and so this was a way of understanding how much food has been used actually as a way to also control native people. And so I, I learned a lot about our, our food history and the, and the fact that Minnesota, the southern half, even 200 years ago was covered with, um, with prairie. You know, and what a beautiful, diverse, rich ecosystem that was. So millions of acres of prairie. And that was, that supported bison and um, white-tailed deer and all these other smaller animals, wild plants. And so the Dakota have lived here on this prairie and really survived um, making use of all those plants and animals so that the culture was based around hunting, gathering wild plants for medicines, and but then also growing um, corn, beans, and squash in the Three Sisters Garden. So then, um, so that so that was part of a traditional diet. And back then, no 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 diabetes, no type two diabetes, um, none of these uh, lifestyle diseases that that are epidemic now today. Um, so you look at that's where the that's where the uh, traditional diet started from. But when uh, native people were moved onto reservations then they were removed from their traditional foods and given commodity foods instead. And they tend to be high in fat, starch, and sugar. And as we all know, what contributes to an unhealthy lifestyle more than, you know, the big three. So um, within a generation, you start to see type 2 diabetes emerging. And it is um, in our communities uh, at epidemic levels. So. Um, so the, the, but the lesson in that then was, again, understanding what has been taken away in order to do the work to reclaim it. So um, one of the sayings that we have at Dream of Wild Health is that our food is our medicine. And that if you are really paying attention to where your food comes from, um, how it was grown, what you're eating, then that you know that's how you preserve your health. You also, um, it's an opportunity to rebuild that connection with the land, which is which is really fundamental to being indigenous. Is that idea that your first and most important relationship is with the earth, and everything else follows from that. And once you break that relationship, once that breaks down, and one of the ways that you do that is through your food, then it's easy for all of these other issues to come in, where you're divided from that relationship, it's easy to turn and look at other people as not your relative either. So, you know, to me that, that it's, a, it's a mindset that gives rise to um, all kinds of forms of racism or not understanding other groups of people or animals or the, how we take care of our water or even our children, you know, the way they're so targeted as consumers. But the work at Dream of Wild Health is actually about helping children rebuild that connection with the land and with their, with, um, with their culture. So we do that um, through a couple of different programs, mostly in the summer. But they're, um, we have chorus kids and garden warriors. And they, they, reach, they work with kids who are 8 to 18. So we have a van that holds 15, so that's the size of our group, which, you know, with teenagers is actually plenty. <laughs> I don't think I could do more than that at a time. You know, it's a lot of hormones in one area. Um, but the, 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 the real, the gratifying part of that work is seeing them transform. So that first day when they come up and they get out of the van, of course they're asleep the whole way up. 
But, you know, they made it, and then they get out of the van, and the first shock is we say, no cell phones, no iPods, no, no electronics. Like, what? <laughs> and they're stuck, because we're in Hugo. So, <laughs> so then um, we start in circle with prayer, and, the, you know, and we start to uh, remind them of their values, who they are. They learn, their, they learn how to introduce themselves the way I did before I started the talk. It's a really important piece. And then they learn, they go out in the garden with the, with the farmers. Um, some of them will go into the kitchen and work with a native chef. This year, we, this past year, we had Brian Yazi. Some of you might have had the good fortune to, he works with Sean Sherman. I'm, you know, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Sean Sherman. So, um, so they actually make lunch using a lot of our vegetables at the farm. And so then lunch is the second shock of the day. Like, almost, you know, all these healthy vegetables, like, you. <laughs> so we just ask that they try them. Some days, you know, those first couple days, a lot of kids will only eat fruit. But, you know, we just encourage them, keep trying it. And then usually by the end of the three week session, they are, they've come around to really enjoying the food. If they come back for more seasons and about half do, we see them transform. So the ones that do well, we invite them to become youth leaders. And they go out into the community the rest of the school year and become advocates. So children who, ha who have a very hard time, um, even sometimes making eye contact, are learn to become public speakers, to go out into conferences and to be able to speak to healthy lifestyles, to go home to their families and say, you know, I learned how to make a kale salad today and, you know, let's have it. So, you know, you can't underestimate the power of that impact of a, of a young voice. Um, so, so the, um, and then in the afternoon we do art projects. We also teach them job skills. So they, we send them to the, the farmer's markets and they get paid a stipend for being in the program, but they get paid hourly for working at the markets. So they have to learn their vegetables. They have to learn how they're prepared. They have to be nice to people. And they, um, you know, and they have to learn to make change. So these are really good, these are good job skills. And we had one young man who started with us at 12, a chorus kid, and he, um, he kept with us every summer. When he was 14, he went through a rough patch. Um, he came from a tough family on the east side of St. Paul, and he got in trouble with the law, and and um, we arranged for him to do his community service with us. So he could be around uh, sober, responsible, um, male, native adults. He made it through that, went on to become, uh, to graduate high school, and then he is now about to finish college at Augsburg in environmental studies. So our hope is that then he will come back and one day, you know, also work for Dream of Wild Health or go off into the world and make beautiful change. So, you know, it's been that it has been the beautiful work of seeing what these kids can do. Um, so that working for Dream of Wild Health has then thinking about um, corn as our relative and teaching the kids that our, our corn is sacred and that um, protecting our seeds is one of the responsibilities that we have to make sure that there is food for the next seven generations. And so I want to read, um, I wrote in A Good Time for the Truth. This is an anthology of essays from writers from all different communities about race. Um, and many of them are very personal. I wrote about corn because um, to me that's a relative and we have to understand how even a, a plant can be oppressed in an industrial agriculture system. And so um, I'm going to just read the, uh, the last little section of that. Through my work at Dream of Wild Health, <clears throat> I have found a way to transform my family's experience into a renewed relationship with our community, the land, and these seeds. When seeds are planted with prayers and songs, tended with love, 
harvested with care, and shared with our community, then our food once again becomes the core of our, of our culture. When we know where our food comes from, we can choose not to be victimized by an industrialized food system. Slowly, over many seasons, I have learned how the worldview that rationalized the genocide of nat Native people is threatening the health and well-being of the earth, our food, and every living being. As we plant the Dakota corn with children who are learning about their traditional foods, we are rebuilding an indigenous relationship with the land. We are recognizing that one of the casualties in this long siege of assimilation has been our relationship with the earth that emphasized how we are all bound together in a web of relationships right down to the smallest bacteria. Many of us have forgotten that learning about plants and animals was a lifelong commitment where the real test of living was to establish a balanced and harmonious relationship with nature. Why? Because our survival depends on it. Today, many of our children are growing up in paved cities, afraid of bees, unable to recognize plants, and often completely ignorant of where their food comes from. And yet, they will inherit this world. They will become its stewards. We are responsible for teaching our children that plants and animals are co-creating this world with us, and the lessons they offer can help us reverse the harms that humans have inflicted. As we say in Dakota, mitakoye owasi, we are all related. When we care for our mother, when we raise healthy children, when we garden, returning to these old ways will help us transcend the trauma of the past as well as that of the present and provide healing for our ancestors. When the blood memory of our children remembers the green corn dance, that is the rhythm of the heart calling us home. So, in closing, I want to remind, I want to also quote Thomas King, and he also said this about stories. Stories are wondrous things, and they are dangerous. So you have to think about the stories we tell ourselves and the stories that don't get told. And what better group to think about that than the friends of the Ramsey <laughs> County Library System. Um, you are lovers of books and you are really keepers of the truth when you hold those stories. So I just, I want to um, applaud all of you for your work in taking on that responsibility for caring for these stories. And I want to, to remind all of us of the words of Chief Sitting Bull. And he said, let us put our minds together and see what kind of world we can make for our children. Adamaya. <laughs> <laughs>